There's a basic formula for action movies and TV shows. A person or group is in deep trouble. They're stuck, captured, or trapped, and doesn't look like they're going to survive. Often, there's a ticking timer to let them, well, really, you know, how much time's left before the bomb goes off, the oxygen runs out, the deadly toxin is released, or the spaceship crashes. Relax, Rod, relax. Right. Don't sweat it, Rod. We got nine minutes and seven seconds left. Right. Looks like we're gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Riggs, what do you think? Hey, hey, wait, wait, Riggs, wait! What? How can you be so sure? Oh, it's just a hunch. You ready? Yep. See? All done. Hey, take me! I love it when the beeping speeds up. That's so realistic. Unless they've decided to kill off your favorite character, they always find a way to escape just in time. Now, spoiler alert for you, the Paw Patrol is always going to win. <laughs> Every time. Tom Cruise is going to pull off the impossible mission. Superman will save the world. Kermit and Miss Piggy will get back together <laughs> every time. Those are my favorite movies. The Bomb Squad, they'll cut the right wire. The Hallmark movie ends with the couple finding true love. Aren't you excited all the Christmas movies started this week? Yeah, isn't that great? 40 days in a row of Hallmark Christmas movies. I can't wait to curl up by the fire and switch it to football. Can I get an amen? amen? Thought that might wake you up. Basketball team makes the shot. The football team scores the touchdown. The cheerleader wins the competition. And Jack Bauer will defy all physical constraints of time to save the world in less than 24 hours. Now, most likely, you're never going to defuse a bomb while the timer ticks. You're not gonna race against the clock to save your spaceship, the president, the planet, or a pack of puppies. But you do face tense situations where you need to be rescued before time runs out. The rent's due Friday, and you don't have enough money in the account. You have to make a major decision about a job, and they want the answer tomorrow. Or you relapse. After months of no drinking, you're locked in your apartment with a bottle. You know you need help, but you don't know who to ask or how to ask, and you need it now. Maybe your marriage is in deep trouble. 
small arguments have turned big and volatile, and now your wife says she's about to file for divorce. Or you've got a huge project to finish and not enough time to finish it. Or your kid's in trouble at school, and you've got to figure out how to help him before he fails. It's when you get the fifth notice on your electric bill that they're going to shut it off. Or your child is sick, and the doctors don't have the answers. At some point, everyone finds themselves in the need of rescue. If that hasn't happened in your life, it will. In those times, what do you do? Where do you turn? How do you find your way through the difficult situation and come out safely on the other side? Today, we're going to look at one of the most famous characters in the Bible and learn from a story and a song. Let me set the scene for you. David was anointed king by a prophet named Samuel. The problem was there was already a king named Saul who wanted to stay king. For a while, it went okay. David served Saul. Everyone was happy. And then David killed Goliath. Israel won a huge victory over their arch enemy, the Philistines. We pick it up right after that. David's the hero. 1 Samuel 18, when the men were returning home after David killed the Philistine. The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, was singing and dancing, joyful songs, tambourines, and lutes. It was a giant countrywide party. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain, God, they've credited David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands. What more can, can he get? but the kingdom. And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Ultimately, Saul decided to kill David to eliminate the competition. David had to run. He was protected by the Lord and survived a number of close calls. The story is like an action movie. Finally, during yet another battle with the Philistines, Saul killed himself. And after years of running, David became king. But the Philistines remained. Now, I just reduced two books of the Bible to two minutes. So I encourage you to read First and Second Samuel. The story is amazing. We pick it up near the end of Second Samuel, chapter 21. Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. David, who killed Goliath, was exhausted. The Bible doesn't tell us why, but we can imagine. David defeated the Philistines once. Now they're back. Facing the same enemy a second time can be incredibly discouraging. You know how that is. You were pronounced cancer-free, and then it came back. And the thought of more chemo and radiation makes you tired before it even begins. Your marriage survived the crisis through counseling and prayer and hard work, but now problems have popped up again, and going through it all again makes you exhausted. You overcame an addiction, but after three years clean, you relapsed. Now you got to start all over again. We all know what it's like, because just when we thought COVID was finally gone and life was getting back to normal, the Delta variant came along. Second time around, the fight was even more exhausting than the first time. I didn't think it was possible, but people were more angry and irrational because they're just tired of it all. It's when you're in deep debt and you worked all the way out and now you find yourself in debt again. And you got to have the conversations and you got to go back through the process. It makes you tired. That was David. Once again, he had to face the Philistines. He'd been in this fight for a long time, and he was wearing down. There's a lesson here. It's not a sin to be worn out and exhausted. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you weed per weird. Let me try that again, because <laughs> I hope you're not a weed person. Um, that doesn't make you a bad person or a weak person, just a tired person. How is that? Thank you. Someone should have clapped that I got that out. <laughs> David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines and became exhausted. And Ishbi ben Ab, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels, in other words, it's a big old spear, who was armed with a new sword, said he would kill David. 
Ishbi Benab saw David was exhausted and he came after him. It was the perfect opportunity to finally get rid of the Philistines' most hated enemy. David was in deep trouble, but Abishai came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. Abishai, one of David's soldiers, saw what was happening and he rose up to defend the king. David's life was saved because Abishai rescued him. If David had been alone, he would have been defeated. By himself, he didn't have a chance, but he wasn't by himself. There's several things to learn from this story. Number one, the enemy attacks when you're weak. Ishbi Benab waited till David was at his weakest before he attacks. Listen to me, Satan's smart. Satan's crafty. He's not gonna attack you when you're strong. He's gonna wait, wait until you're at your weakest. And it's your weakest moment when you're exhausted, when you're tired, when you're worn out for the fight. That's when, David, that's when Satan's gonna attack. He's gonna just try to destroy your testimony. He's gonna try to steal everything from you that the Lord gave you. He's smart. Lesson number two, even good people, God's people, sometimes need to be rescued. David was doing the right thing, right time. His circumstance was not because of his sin. He just was at the end. He couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't stand alone. Sometimes you're weak through no fault of your own. The battle takes its toll. You don't have the strength to fight. In those moments, God will come to your rescue and God will send others. Lesson three, it's foolish to fight alone. We're stronger together. When you're weak, surround yourself with people who are strong. And that, I don't understand it, but that's often the exact opposite of what people do. When they're discouraged and worn out, they stay away from church. They stay home and isolate from others when they most need others. When they struggle with sin, they decide it'll be easier to struggle alone. I see this so often when addicts have a relapse. They're so racked with shame and so frustrated that they, they, they withdraw. They quit coming to church. They don't want to admit weakness, so they isolate. That's the worst time to isolate because isolation feeds addiction. When you're weak, instead of withdrawing and isolating, reach out, get in community with other believers. I love online church, but this is one reason why it's important to be at church in person, because you need community. You need the family of God. Confess your weakness and ask for help because we are better and we are stronger when we are together. Out here on this journey to a place called surrender It gets lonely as we try to find our way Sometimes on this pathway we fall down and we crumble and we've all felt the lonely sting of pain Step seems a little easier to take So here I am, a be friend to help you when you stumble I'll walk beside you on this road of grace I will be the hands and feet of the love who died to save you And remind you that no matter what you face You're never alone
Lesson number four, family fights together. And make sure you heard me. I didn't say family fights each other. (laughs) Family fights together. You don't have to fight alone. You are not in this battle by yourself. Look at me. Listen to me. You're not alone. God's on your side and we're on your side. We will fight for you. We will fight with you. We're in this together. Because we're family. And you might, you might be in a situation where you feel like David. You're just weary and exhausted. Maybe you've been fighting the same battle for a long time. Or suddenly you find yourself fighting the same battle again. It might just be the pressures and the struggles of life. But you say, Pastor Rod, I'm, I am worn out, just exhausted. Just getting up in the morning sometimes feels like a victory. You say, I just, I really need God's strength. I need him to come rescue me from this. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you just bow your heads with me? If you... If you say, Pastor Rod, that's that's me. I'm weary. I'm exhausted. And I need strength. Would you just stand right where you're at? We're going to pray for you. Say, what are people going to think? They're going to think you're weary and exhausted since that's what we're talking about. It's one of those moments. If that's you, (laughs) don't isolate because you need your church family. If somebody's standing, would you stand beside them? Put your hand on their shoulder, put your arm around them. We're just going to pray. We're going to pray together right now for the strength of God. And just before we pray, I want you to listen to me. This battle won't last forever. I mean, I just, I really sense the Lord wants to say that to some people in this room, some people watch online. This battle won't last forever. God is going to bring you through it. And you're going to come out on the other side. And you're going to come out on the other side strong. You will not be destroyed. You will not be destroyed because your heavenly father is on your side. 
and he's going to lift you up and you're going to rise and you're going to stand not in your strength and your power but in his strength and his power come on let's just pray right now in jesus name i pray lord for the strength and power of our god in jesus name lord we we stand in your presence we wait on you because your word says they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they'll mount up on wings as eagle. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Lord, we wait on you, believing that as we do, that you restore us and you renew our strength. God, I pray for people who felt like they're just ready to give up, that there's no hope and that there's no chance and they don't know what's gonna happen or how they can go on in this moment, Lord. Fill them with your strength. Restore their hope. God, let them, let them see themselves the way you see them, as a victorious overcomer, as a child of God, who you have a plan and a purpose for. Lord, I just, I speak it over and I pray it over them right now that they will come through this strong. They'll come out on the other side with a greater confidence and a greater trust and a greater faith in you. Lord, I pray tonight when they lay down to sleep that they would rest well, that they sleep soundly. And when they wake in the morning, they'd have a new energy and a new strength and your mercy would have been renewed. Lord, I pray for a change in circumstances, but more than us, I pray for a change in us in circumstances. Lord, I pray against the discouragement because things aren't the way they were. I pray against defeat because it doesn't seem like it's coming back. And I pray instead for just an excitement and a joy and a confidence in the Lord because all things are in your hands and we trust you, Lord. We trust you, Jesus. And so we just stand in your presence and receive from you. We receive from you, Lord. We receive from you, Jesus. Come on, if you're weary, I want you to just raise both hands and just receive from him right now. In Jesus' name, we receive from you, Lord. We receive your strength. We receive your power. We receive divine energy in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You're faithful, God. Faithful, Lord. Faithful, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We're grateful to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Abishai rescued David. And then David did what David often did. He wrote a song. Now, I can't sing it to you because I don't know the melody. But I can read it to you. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. David recognized that even though Abishai was the guy who physically fought, Abishai was not his deliverer. Abishai was just there. He was there and willing to be used by the Lord in David's rescue. Abishai struck the blow, but God gained the glory. We're family. We're God's family. We fight together. And family doesn't stop here. We have brothers and sisters all around the world. Burundi, third poorest country in the world, only 7% of the people have electricity. It's a desperate place. Jerome was sent to pastor a church in a small village in the most difficult area of the country. It's heavily Islamic. Everyone assumed he would fail. 
They, their building wasn't. They had dirt on the ground and they had a metal roof. They had no walls, no windows, no doors. There were less than 10 people in the church, including his family. They had nothing. There wasn't enough offering to even buy food. He had no idea how he was going to survive, but he had a confidence in the Lord. In front of the church, there are two avocado trees. And incredibly, well, Jerome and his family had nothing. Those two avocado trees produce fruit all year long, a continual harvest. And just about the time they got tired of avocados, in the lot behind the church, vegetables just started coming up out of the ground. They didn't plant them. They didn't water them. They didn't weed it. They just appeared. Corn, tomatoes, potatoes, other vegetables. And just like the avocado trees, the vegetable plants kept producing all year round. For two years, Jerome and his family lived on avocados and vegetables from their miracle garden. God provided them with food. A church that was closing down gave them a sound system. Another pastor donated chairs. The church began to grow, and finally, after two years, there was enough church members that the offering was enough to buy food. And when they finally had enough to live on, the avocado trees quit producing, and the miracle garden dried up. Is that coincidence? I don't think so. God knew what that pastor and his family needed, and he provided for them. And this morning, just a few hours ago, there were more than 800 people in that church. Not only that, but that church has already this year planted six new churches. And every time they planted a new church, they sent 40 people from their church out to start it. God didn't just rescue. God blessed them above and beyond. Every Friday and Saturday, Jerome has open office. Anyone can come and talk. And sheikhs, imams, leaders of the mosque started coming. Jerome didn't know anything about how to minister to Muslims, how to respond to their questions or answer their arguments. But he found a global university course called Introduction to Muslims. He read it twice, and he learned how to share Jesus with Muslims. And there are now dozens of former Muslims who've accepted Jesus and are part of the church. A couple years ago, when you gave in an offering to produce global university courses, you didn't know it. But you were part of God's plan to rescue Muslims in Burundi when Jerome received that course. 2013, our team leaders were kicked out of Sudan. The church was forced underground. Persecution began. The next six years were incredibly difficult. But in 2019, pressure began to ease. Our team leaders began the process of trying to register the Assemblies of God with the government, but they kept running into roadblocks. This guy would say, you got to go see this guy. He would say, you got to go see this guy. Finally, when they got to the guy, he'd say, come back in a week. Then he'd say, come back in a month. They'd come back. They just kept... Nothing was working. And finally, they called me, and I know no one in Sudan. But they knew we had a political leader in our church who just might be willing to help rescue. And that guy in our church was able to connect with powerful friends in our government. And a United States senator wrote a letter asking the Sudanese government to recognize the Assemblies of God. And our leaders went back, back to the same official, but suddenly everything changed. When they sat down to meet with him, he looked at them, same guy who kept putting them off and putting them off. He he looked at them and said, I have received the letter from your government, and before you leave today, you will have your registration. And we are now officially recognized in Sudan. That's pretty awesome. Here's why that matters. As a result of that registration, we can now legally plant churches. We have an open door to bring ministers as missionaries. We have a bank account. We can buy and sell property. We can conduct marriages in public. 
Our leader in Sudan said, we're now part of the legal system. It will be difficult for them to stop the church now. They may can kick out missionaries, but they can't stop the church. Would you pray for our missionaries and our pastors in Sudan? Because Monday this week, there was a coup. And no one knows exactly what's going to happen. Um, but our, our people are safe. They've got food and water. They're, they're alive and well. They just don't know what's going to happen next for the church. So this week, when God puts it on your heart, pray for Sudan. Pray for our missionaries there. Matter of fact, let's pray right now. Lord, we pray for the church in Sudan. We pray for our missionaries. Lord, you brought us to this place. And we know you didn't bring us to this place just for us to go backwards. And so we pray, Lord, for our missionaries. We pray for their safety. We pray for their protection. We pray for our pastors and for our churches that they'll be covered by your protection and by your love. Lord, we pray that you would soften the hearts of people who've taken charge and that what the enemy intends for evil, you would use for good. We, we fight with our brothers and sisters and we fight the most effective way. We fight in prayer, believing, Lord, in your power. Strengthen them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to go back, and I want to share a Sudan story with you that I shared 12 months ago, because now I know the rest of the story. So I'm going to, for those of you who weren't here 12 months ago, I'm going to tell the story, and then you'll hear the rest. Adam was saved in one of our underground churches in Sudan. When all our missionaries had to leave the country, persecution became very intense, and Adam was thrown in prison for his faith. In prison, he began sharing his sharing Jesus with other prisoners, and they were giving their hearts to the Lord. And the warden finally came and said, you can't do that in my prison. And Adam wouldn't stop. So the warden threw Adam in solitary confinement. Now, it's a little different than in the movies. Sudanese solitary confinement, in Adam's case, was at the toilet stall. Literally, he was locked in the toilet and forced to watch other prisoners go to the bathroom 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because he wouldn't quit talking about Jesus. The warden was certain that would break him, that Adam would renounce his faith in Jesus and return to Islam, but it didn't. Instead, Adam seemed happy in the toilet. The warden was confused, so finally he sent a guard in disguise to the toilet to find what was going on. I mean, you can't make this kind of stuff up. And he discovered that when each prisoner came into the toilet stall, instead of being shamed and embarrassed, Adam took advantage of the fact that he had a captive audience and he shared Jesus. He was leading Muslim prisoners to Jesus while they went to the bathroom. Now, that's what I shared 12 months ago. Here's the rest of the story. It wasn't only prisoners who came to the toilet. Guards came. Adam said... The most precious time in my life was in that toilet. I had good time with Jesus. When the soldiers came to the bathroom, the Lord showed me what they needed to hear. When one soldier came in, Adam said to him, your daughter's going to be healed. She'll be just fine. The soldier was shocked and said, how did you know? And Adam said, God told me. God kept telling Adam about people's lives. Adam shared with the guards details only God could have told him. And before long, everyone was making excuses to go to the toilet. <laughs> and prisoners and guards were accepting Jesus there. The, warrior, the warden gave up and announced he was letting Adam go because he couldn't stop him. Yeah. Only God. <laughs> A few weeks ago, we were with the leaders of Sudan in Africa. And they shared with us, Adam's journey hasn't been easy. Persecution pressure has continued. Adam said, I lost my job. I lost my motorcycle. I almost lost my house, but I refused to give up. And one afternoon, just a couple months ago, Adam got on the bus to come home. There was only one seat open, so he sat down. And he sensed the person next to him looking at him. And when he turned, he realized he was sitting next to the cruelest guard from the prison a guy who had tortured him and who'd done everything he could to make Adam's life miserable. To Adam's surprise, the guard began crying and asked Adam for forgiveness. 
Adam sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit. He turned, he held the hands of his torture. He looked at me, he said, Jesus forgives you, you're my brother. The soldier said, I watched you in prison. I saw how you acted and I see now how you forgive me. What you say must be true. Adam's torture is now studying the Bible with him and on his way to becoming a follower of Jesus. When you gave in an offering to produce the Arabic fire Bible, you had no way of knowing that one day Adam would meet his torture on a bus and open a Bible you paid for and share Jesus. Adam now leads six house churches. The main church meets in his home. They're out of space. God's doing remarkable things among Muslims in Sudan. Our team leader, Paul, he's a physical therapist. And uh, recently he was visiting one of our English centers and he saw Abdo in the corner sitting on a chair. Now, sitting on a chair is not unusual to us. It's very unusual to them because they normally, they sit like this. They stay like this for hours. They crouch down like they're in a chair, but they're not in a chair. Now, I can do that for a while, but my quads are screaming right now. That's how they sit for hours. So Paul knew something was wrong, and he asked Abdo about it and then said, can I take a look? And he saw that Abdo had very few muscles in his legs. His back had atrophied muscles. Paul said, I'll help you with the exercises. You'll be better. We'll do three sessions a week, but one rule. Every session... I will begin and end by praying for you in the name of Jesus. Abdul is a leader in the mosque, but he, he hurt. He said, okay. Paul went one week. The second week when he went to the house, Abdul's wife opened the door and she said, he's not here. He went to drink tea with his friends. Paul went to find him and found him in a tent, crouching down in the typical Sudanese style. 20 men around him all leaders of the mosque. And Abdu said, Paul, please sit with us. When the tea came, Abdu said, now tell them about the one you pray to before and after my session because they he healed me. And Paul began to explain the Bible in Arabic to the leaders of the mosque. And when he was done, the men said, you are part of us. Anything you want, you can have. We need more people like you in Sudan. In Sudan, God used a preacher locked in a toilet, a physical therapist, and an Arkansas politician as part of his rescue plan for the church. Who would have ever imagined that? And on that team, we have teachers and counselors and engineers, physical therapists, ordinary men and women who've responded to the call of God and his heart to rescue Sudanese. Do you know what that means? God wants to use you as part of his rescue plan. Every one of us has a part. If you've been around a long time, you remember about 10 years ago, about this time of year, I told you that we really sensed the Lord telling us that we needed to move from just a giving church to a sending church, that we were giving our money, but that we needed to be willing to send our sons and our daughters our grandsons and our granddaughters, it's easy to give money. If you've settled the issue that Jesus is Lord of your life, of course you give the missions. Every, every true follower of Jesus gives the missions. We get that. But giving your kids and your grandkids, that's, that's harder. And we sense the Lord saying that to us. And now I want to share with you the missionaries from our church family who are on the field this is just from the last 10 years. I won't use the last names of some of them because they're in restricted countries. But here's the list now. JT and Rachel. Robin. Evan and Janelle. Jacob and Simone. Derek and Tammy Walker. Stanley and Catherine Hall. Travis and Cindy Michael. Zach and Olivia Rice. Michael and Tiffany Richardson. Cody and Brittany Griggs. Matt and Andrea Marlin. Kyle and Portia Kaufman, Jack Scrimshire, Stephen and Sarah Edwards, Dick and Jen. That's 28 people 
since we sense what the Lord was telling us to do. It's powerful. Some go, some help, some pray, almost all give. We all have a part because we're family. There's a card in your bulletin. I want you to take it out. Every October, we make a commitment for the next 12 months what we'll give to missions. If you're watching online, uh, there's a link you can click on in the chat section on the right side of the screen. Or if you're watching a full screen version, you can go to firstnlr.com slash pledge. Some of you have never made a commitment to missions. I challenge you to start. Start at $5 a week, less than the price of one cup of coffee at Starbucks. You say, what difference does $5 a week make? By itself, not much, but when we combine it together, this year we'll give over $2 million to missions. So it makes a big difference. If everyone who watches online gave just $1 more a week, we would give another $3 million to missions this year. So would you consider joining us, even at just $1 a week? You say, well, Pastor Rod, I give the missions, I just don't like filling out cards. Two things in response to that. Number one, grow up. <laughs> Number two, that's a problem because we fill out cards. We make commitments to missionaries based on your commitments. So fill out the card and drop it in the bucket when it comes by in just a moment. With your missions giving, we support 230 min missionaries and ministries in over 100 countries. Your regular giving keeps them on the field. There's also a line on the card for you to write the name of the person you're gonna share Jesus with in 2022. Write that name down. And as you commit to share Jesus with them, we're gonna pray with you that they will respond to his love. I want you to understand, when you give, you're not giving to First NLR. You're providing Adam with a Bible to give his torture. You're giving Jerome a class on how to share Jesus with Muslims. You're providing housing for missionaries. You're rescuing women and children from sexual slavery. You're feeding the homeless. You're supporting missionaries so they can stay in Sudan and Burundi and more than 100 countries around the world. When you give, God's rescuing people. When you give, God is using you as part of his rescue plan. And I want you to be open to the possibility that God's calling you to do more than give. He's calling you to go. Like I said, money's easy. We've settled that issue. Obedience is his call. And I challenge you to say yes to God. I want to pray for you. When I'm done praying, the ushers will come and pick up the cards. And then, then we're just going to we're going to have a time of just receiving from Jesus. So Mary Grace is going to lead us in a song. And I'm just going to believe that as she sings, that if you have a need, as she, as she sings, I just want you to receive from the Lord. Stand up and begin to receive from him. Because when we speak the name of Jesus, things happen. And today, Jesus can heal you. Jesus can turn around your marriage. Jesus can change your financial picture. Jesus can give you hope in the future. He can chase away depression. I want you to receive from him. Lord, thank you for that we can be part of your rescue plan. We commit that. We've, Lord, we already do that. Giving money to missions is easy. Of course we do that. But I pray, Lord, that we would go beyond giving and we would be obedient. And if you say go, we'll go and obey you and follow your plan. Lord, I pray that you would do miracles in this room, that you touch and heal people, you'd strengthen bodies and restore, Lord, because you are the God who rescues, and our hope is in you. In Jesus' name, amen.